All right, so it's been about a year now since Gamergate first started, and uh, wow, <laughs> since it first began, a lot of things have happened. I mean, there there have been so many like you know articles and things that have been discovered, and uh, really a lot of these uh, journalists and um, these websites have really been proven to be just as corrupt as everybody thought that they were. However, somehow there are still a lot of people who are completely and utterly buying into that tired old narrative that no, Gamergate is just about oppressing women, it's just about, you know, uh, trying to, you know, it's, it, Gamergate is just all about trying to, like, threaten women with rape to, like, get them, like, kicked out of the industry, or, like, just even that. This quote Wired Magazine article, Gamergate makes a political movement out of threatening with rape any woman who has the temerity to offer an opinion about a video game. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's so ridiculous. Katie, Katie, you're in the Gamergate. How many women have you threatened to rape? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I've lost count at this point. Like, you know, at least probably ev every woman, all, all women. Just don't say scissor, you're going to trigger me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, it's... At this point, it's almost like... It's a little dumbfounding to see publications still trying to push that idea. It's like, really? I mean, even after, even after Airplay, I mean, and and uh, the, the panel that was at Airplay was like really diverse. I mean, there was, there was just you know all. I mean, there was like three women, like uh, Oliver Campbell, and then there was Milo, who's like gay, and I think there was only like one. Wasn't there only just like one straight white guy, right? Uh, two. So. There was Mark Cab and also Alan Bakari. But the the point still stands. The uh, the lineup that was chosen to represent Gamergate was basically an equivalent of the cast of freaking Captain Planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, the progressives still try to push this narrative that no Gamergate is just a bunch of basement dwelling neckbeards, white straight white straight male neckbeards, I might add. Well, it, it, it violated their narrative so much that they had to call in bomb threats. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you got pictures of old Oliver escorting kindly old ladies out of the building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what I want to discuss with you guys today is, you know, it's like, why, why is this still happening? Because obviously, you know, in the past, uh, the CCS channel has kind of discussed these quote unquote puppet masters where people who are, you know, kind of in this for their own personal gain in a way like, you know, such as obviously Anita Sarkeesian is the big one and, you know, Zoe Quinn, those people who kind of thrive off this idea of the, the victimhood and, you know, so there's a reason for them to continuously be sticking with this type of narrative. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, like you said, for these people, uh, victimhood is basically their bread and butter this is their job and this is how they initially rose to power because the stuff they were the stuff they were talking about is something that i would argue that most people can get behind like you know equality for everyone tolerance understanding compassion like most people can can relate to it but the problem is, is they feel good words yeah, and obviously that's the current state of our society where everyone wants to feel good about what they do. Like this post on Facebook to cure cancer. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's understandable why people initially chose to support them. However, three years afterwards, when we've gone from, we believe, in equality between sexes to air freaking air conditioning in offices is sexist yeah. in oppressing women <laughs> how why are people still buying why are people still following these hashtag messiahs as we have called them in the past yeah and i actually i had a discussion with my mother not too long ago that i think kind of shines a light on this type of mindset and why some people buy into it so easily um now I was talking with my mom, I'm like, I just don't understand, like, why there are so many people my age who are just so overly obsessive about the, these kind of, um, these kind of topics. Social issues. Yeah, these kind of social issues, and it's like, you know, like Max said, you know, the, the issues at their core are very important, but there's people who just take it and run with it so far, and they just take it so over the top, and I'm like, why is this happening? They're it's because they're the new converts. You see it in fucking religion all the time. People who, who had either a different religion or had no religion at all, they see the light, and all of a sudden, they're the ones beating you over the head with a fucking cross. Exactly, but see, that's that's exactly pretty much what my mom said. She said, well, the way I see it is that most of these kids, if you look at them, most of them, when they were growing up, they were incredibly sheltered. 
But then suddenly、mm-hmm. they get to college, and that's when they actually start learning about the entire world. They actually start learning about instances of real sexism, instances of actual racism,、so、the stuff that is、Fucking、honestly genocide. Really bad, exactly, the stuff that's really bad that they didn't know about up until that point. So they're suddenly hit with all of this information at once, and then they're like, "Oh my god!" Up until now, I was just, you know, I was in this little protected bubble, and then they feel guilty, and that guilt. Drives them to take everything so far, extreme lengths, extreme lengths、yes. because they feel like they need to make up for all that time that they were sheltered, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it it, it feels like that for a lot of people. That's what is driving them to follow a lot of these narratives.、Mm-hmm. As an addendum to what Katie has just said,、uh, yes, college is where a lot of these kids learn all of this hogwash. Especially if we're talking about liberal arts colleges, and the reason for this is because a lot of their education is being conducted through the prism of feminism, and a lot of the professors at these places, they do tend to lean extremely to the left, and as a result, they oftentimes allow their own personal biases and convictions to shape the curriculum. And sure, technically the students could always go their own way, so to speak, and seek out the truth in their spare time. But when you have a person in a position of authority, i.e., the professor, telling you that up is down and the left is right, and what's even more unsettling, all the other students seem to buy their rhetoric hook, line, and sinker, I can actually understand why some students would prefer to just keep their head down and go with the flow. I mean, if you're stuck inside an echo chamber, it's really hard to hear any of the voices coming from the outside. And actually, a lot of these people that are kind of following, you know, the the, the ones that like kind of guilt tripped into this, they're not super duper brainwashed by it. They just are following it because they think, well, this is the right thing to do. You know, of course, I'm gonna like support women's rights and you know, racial racial issues because that's like the good thing, right? And I'm just gonna go really hard at it because these people need help and things like that. However,、uh, I have a couple friends personally that you know I've talked to them about these issues and you know they're really gung ho about it. And I'm like, well, actually, you know that one in five myth about You know, one in five women get women gets raped on campus or whatever. That's actually not true. And like, here's an article that proves it. And then, you know, my friend read it, and then she's like, "Oh, wow! Actually, I didn't know that." And so, some of these people, they're just in a way misinformed. They, they're, they're misinformed, you know. And so, you know, when I see a lot of times online, I'll see people like, you know, really. Um, just crazily going after、um, social justice warriors and like, oh, all these people are like only have this mindset, like you know, to try and get somewhere, like push their own goals or something. Like, honestly, a lot of these people are just kind of in a way they're naive and they, they think that they're doing the right thing, but they're kind of just going in the wrong direction with it. Or they could they could be following you know the trend of the cool kids. You know, the cool kids are all saying this, and you know, that's true.、Uh, Yeah, because it's it's it's, it's total sheep mentality.、Mm-hmm. It's, it's trying to fit in with the herd. It's it's a human instinct. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to really voice your opinion when it seems like everybody else is, you know, has a has a different opinion.、Exactly. Or it、um, could also be peer pressure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's just that's exactly what it is. It's just peer pressure. I mean, again, it's a human tendency to not want to stand out in a crowd. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and especially these days, there is definitely more than over the last decade, we have started to. Kind of come into the rise of this culture of victimhood, and、um, there was a article on Reason.com that kind of talked about this. And、uh, one of the quotes from that article kind of summed it up very, very well. And this is the quote: In other words, as progress is made towards a more equal and humane society, it takes a smaller and smaller offense to trigger a high level of outrage. The goalposts shift. Allowing participants to maintain a constant level of, level of anger and constant level of perceived victimization, and that honestly makes a lot of sense to me because you do see that kind of thing, you know, in in colleges, mostly colleges. You know, there there will be instances as simple and as innocent as asking someone, "Where are you from?" and that can be perceived as racist, discriminatory. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, honestly, you know, isn't that one of the first questions you ask somebody? So, hey, where are you from?、Mm-hmm. You know, oh yeah, I've been to that place. It's pretty cool. Or no, I always wanted to visit that place. It's an icebreaker. Yeah. People don't fucking see this and say it's like, how dare you oppress me from being from where I am? It's like, no, I was just trying to make conversation and see、yeah. if you might want to be my friend. But you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but apparently, in their mind,、uh, a colleague or a classmate just asking you, hey, where are you from originally, is the same thing as a Nazi SS officer asking you for papers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! 
Well, it's it's getting to that level of fucking intolerance mm-hmm. too. I mean, and this isn't this is not hyper tolerance. This is fucking intolerance. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's gone to such a fucking length that it's almost completely looped back around. Yeah. It's like just asking where you're from and getting getting inflamed about it. That's intolerance. I mean, goddamn, it. it's it's absolutely nuts. And of course, that's exactly what this article from um, Reason says, and it's quoting a study by uh, sociologists Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning, who wrote Microaggression and Moral Cultures. And what they're they're concluding is kind of what we've been saying, is that individuals uh, and groups now have a high sensitivity to slight, which have a tendency to handle conflicts through complaints to third parties mm-hmm. and seek to cultivate an image of being victims who deserve assistance. It's it's this, it's this playground mentality where instead of like problem solving and settling dis- disputes without having outsiders, you gotta run and tell the teacher when someone says something you don't like. Exactly, and that's that is one of the reasons why a lot of these guilt trips people they decide to go with this kind of uh victim card mentality rather than actually going and researching things and perhaps educating themselves because and this this study actually um explored this they asked the question why emphasize one's victimization and they concluded that um actually the in in a system where you know there are a lot of people who feel like they're oppressed, then those people can end up getting power over, you know, whoever they think is oppressing them. It, it, it is kind of this power play type of thing because you're right. That, you think? <laughs> well, they can go and <laughs> all, run all the evidence whoever. shows that. Yes, so. exactly. Because it, you know this, this quote here it says you know their adver- their adversary is a privilege and blameworthy, but they themselves are pit- uh, are pitiable and blameless. So it's easier and in in a way oftentimes it gets them farther if they just stick with this idea that they are a victim. Mm-hmm. Not to mention that uh, this victimhood mentality, it also absolves a person from any and all personal responsibility for their, yes. for their actions. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly, because that's, that's part of the whole entire victimhood complex, is that you, you project your inequities, you know, maybe you are, are a woman and you're working somewhere and, you know, you get, you get like, you know, laid off or something like that, well, then you can just point at the guy who laid you off, and th- it's not financial reasons why you got laid off, it's because that guy's a sexist. Yes, exactly, actually, and this, uh, this reminds me of another article that we found um, from the Washington Post, where uh, the University of California is actually considering this, uh, this law where they will recognize a quote-unquote right to be free from expressions of intolerance now that to me even just that the that fucking like title of the article already i'm like wait a second that is so fucking vague you can just say anything and everything is like you know an expression of intolerance you know somebody fucking like looks at you for a little too long oh that was sexist it's intolerant and they can get they can get the person kicked out of the school i mean there are some places that really are just <laughs> except what here intolerance will not be tolerated <laughs> <laughs> but i mean as funny as it is to joke about the fact that some institutions are actually like taking this kind of idea seriously is really fucking scary for our society mm-hmm. it's extremely patronizing too to the people involved i mean uh, to to infantize all these fucking people from any moral responsibility and saying that no you just can't say anything that's that's bad i mean it's it's like okay what's gonna happen when these college kids get out into the real world Mm. and they're confronted by real shit exactly yeah see i'll tell you what's gonna happen they're all gonna end up working as baristas at starbucks (laughs) yeah but see no that's that's something that i always wonder and i always cinemax cinemax i want to have a i want to have a conversation with you about race (laughs) (laughs) Uh, those poor employees <laughs> terrified for their job and their own safety. Yeah, but see... Forced. I mean, can you honestly think you're walking to a Starbucks and you're white and all of a sudden the guy on the counter is like, hey, what do you think about black people? It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> but my my question, though, is that, you know, what does what does happen when these people graduate their little safe, safe space college areas and go out into the real world? You know, they're going to be at their fucking job. They're going to have a bad day or, like, they're going to get an email that is somehow seen sexist to them. What are they going to do? Go to their bosses and say, I got to go to the place and sit in a safe space because, like, I was triggered today. Their ass is going to I need to go to the safe room. Yeah, they're going to get fired because that's not yes. how the real world works. 
Well, one thing, once again, this all comes back to the Puppet Master versus the Puppets dichotomy. What the, uh, what the Puppet Masters are doing is that despite the fact that they claim to be for progress and social justice and equality, in reality what they're doing is they're driving a wedge between people. Uh, especially when all these young people in colleges are taught that basically the white, straight, male, evil, capitalist, patriarchal society is the absolute worst devil ever. They're exploiting the outrage of these victims. Yes, exactly, and when you have this society of misinformed young people who don't really know what to do with their life because they're living a pretty sheltered, pretty safe lifestyle, and a lot of them want to basically recreate the quote-unquote glory days of the 60s when the hippies were protesting against the Vietnam War. They want to they wanna identify themselves with some larger movement that's fighting against the establishment. And we're the counterculture, man. <laughs> we want to make a change in the world, man. And unfortunately, because of their desire to attach themselves to something larger than themselves, they end up being bamboozled by the puppet masters that we talked about, mm. such as Anita Sarkeesian, Jessica Valenti, Brianna Wu, Zoe Quinn, whatever, whatever. Gawker in general. Mm -hmm. But the problem is what I'm wondering about, what exactly is their end goal? Mm -hmm. All right, to quote Anita Sarkeesian, everything is racist, everything is sexist, everything needs to be criticized. All right, uh, and then what? Exactly. Mm -hmm. To quote stand-up comedian Joe Rogan, uh, who pretty much summarized the issue with social justice warriors, the problem with these people is that they they never create anything, they never contribute anything. All they do is just complain. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's exactly like uh, when Anise Arkeesian was watching the last E3 and she's screaming about how how everything's violent and she's shifting her own goalposts too by saying like, uh, oh, um. Uh, dishonored, you can play as a male or female protagonist. Well, why can't you just play as a female? <laughs> and it's like, excuse me, uh, weren't you wanting equality? Uh, how, yeah. how much more equal can you get than you can play, you can choose to play as a male or female protagonist. It's up to you and your play preference. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, they'll say, okay, well, a woman in a video game can't be put in a perilous situation or otherwise it, it makes her look weak. Or she can't, like, exactly. you know, have a conflict with a male character, otherwise it's sexist in some way. Or she can't, you know, she can't do this, she can't do that. They have a whole bunch of lists of can't, 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 don't, 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 don't. But in the end, if you actually follow their instructions and not have all of those things, what you end up with is a female character who can't have any flaws, which in turn is a boring, flat character. Well, yeah, just look at the Order 1886. I mean, fucking hell, every female character in that fucking game is a strong female character who don't need no man. She's tough. She can hang out with the boys. Yeah, but and see... They're all, they're, all complete, they're all completely interchangeable, and it's exactly. just boring as fuck. Yeah. So it's like... I don't even, I'm not even sure what they want. And see, I don't know. They don't even they, know what they exactly. want. Exactly. See, they don't know what they want either. They're just kind of, they really just scream to me as just this like, group of lost children just floundering around. You know, they, they want to do something good, but they're not really sure. And they're like, oh yeah, women, women shouldn't be put in perilous situations. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. But they don't, they're not taking into account the like actual, you know, the writing behind it and, you know, how character development actually works. And that if you don't have a character that has some kind of flaws, then that character is going to end up being really boring. So to me, it's kind of like they, they're at this kind of like, dead end like i don't really they have put themselves in this little box because they're never happy you know right. and well they're trying to put these characters in little boxes and these boxes just don't fit it's certainly a never-ending cycle of outrage is what it is and um truth is i'm not sure if people if these people even want to see any actual change take place because as we said before, if there's a solution to the problem, well, all of a sudden, their entire reason for existence, their raison d'etre, if you will, it's their gone. Their income, their fame, their victimhood status on, like, you know, the uh, Colbert Report and even John Oliver's show, uh, all evaporates if they actually fix the fucking problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, when it comes to quote-unquote positive representation of female characters in uh, video games, because there are so much inconsistency and there's so many standards and rules as far as uh, how a female character has to be written. The problem is, as we said, if you try to follow these rules, you end up with a very bland, very uninteresting, very Mary Sue type of character that no one is going to identify with. I mean, a comment I saw on the Gamergate wiki that uh, perfectly summarizes this is, uh, it's called the Galbrush Paradox. 
And the writer of this comment draws a parallel between Guybrush Treepwood and basically his argument is like this. Consider Guybrush Treepwood, star of the Monkey Island series. He's weak, socially awkward, cowardly, kind of a nerd, and generally the last person you would expect to be a captain of a pirate ship. Over the course of the game, he is abused, verbally and physically, mistreated, shunned, hated, and generally made to feel unwanted. Now, let's say Guybrush was a girl. We'll call her Galbrush. Galbrush is weak, socially awkward, cowardly, kind of a nerd, and generally the last person you would expect to be a captain of a pirate ship. Over the course of the game, she is abused, verbally and physically, mistreated, shunned, hated, and generally made to feel unwanted. And then the author of the post gets to the core of his argument. Quote, Now, you might notice that I've given the exact same description for both of these characters. But here's where things deviate. While no one cares if Guybrush takes a pounding for being, for lack of a better term, a less than ideal pirate, Galbrush will be presumed to be discriminated against because of her gender. In fact, every hardship she will endure, though they are exactly the same as the hardships that Guybrush endured, will be considered misogyny rather than someone being ill-suited to their desired calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, a, there's kind of a sick double standard there. Well, it, it also smacks of something that uh, was pretty profound in the, one of the last uh, Penn Sunday School episodes that I listened to. Um, basically, Matt Goudeau is doing a Fifty Shades of Grey parody. And there, there comes to a point in the show where, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, uh, they're, they're painting this picture of the, the, the Grey character, you know, the, the female user and abuser who apparently a lot of 40-plus-year-old women are flocking to and, you know, loving uh, as a character. Mm -hmm. uh, they're painting a picture of how this guy looks, and all of a sudden it shows Matt Goudeau. He was, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of just, you know, like a, a schlubby average Joe Blow guy, right? Not like, you know, uh, Chris Hemingsworth or anything like that. And there, there's right. a nervous, there's, there's, a, there's a laugh coming from, especially the women in the audience, right? And Penn was sitting there, you know, thinking, wait a minute, there's something really odd going on here. If that was played up with, like, the gender is reversed, where, you know, like, the, the, the joke is going to be, you know, that this woman's talked up like she's a supermodel, you know, and she's going to be the most gorgeous thing ever. And then it curtain goes up and, you know, there's just, you know, an average looking woman. Katie and, Bates. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody's starts laughing at that. Isn't that offensive? Yeah, people probably would like go off on tirades and be like, "Oh yeah, oh, yeah that's it's how how would they how dare they judge How a woman? dare they define like, what beauty yes, is? Exactly. They don't they don't know how they don't know her inner worth or whatever, you know. The yeah, usual beauty thing. is on the inside. Right. Never mind the fact that the only reason, you know, they find Christian Grey charming is because he's the tall, dark, handsome, multi billionaire who has a dark, mysterious streak to him and the, the big protagonist. Dick. <laughs> well, that that helps as well, of course. And of course the, the, the frumpy plain Jane protagonist, she then tries to domesticate him and whatnot and yeah, boy, but remember, kids, if you find Scarlett Johansson attractive, then you're a fucking rapist, but if you're a female and you like Christian Grey, then you're being empowered somehow, despite the fact that you would be technically in handcuffs. In handcuffs <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spanked. You, yeah, it, it's, it's empowering to want to be, you know, tied up and BDSM'd by uh, Christian Grey. That's, that, that's feminism, right? 